Good morning, High Rock family. My name is Bryn, and I'm the lead pastor at High Rock North Shore. And I'm Matt. I'm the lead pastor at High Rock Haverhill. And for the last time, it's great to be worshiping with you in this virtual space. Happy Memorial Day weekend. And a special shout out to our Sanctuary Watch Party crew. We are glad to be worshiping in person and singing in person for the first time this week. And for the rest of us, wherever you're celebrating this long weekend, we are glad that you're able to join us, whether that's from the beach... From the lake. From the hot tub. From the mountains. From your RV. Or from your home. Welcome. If you're new with us or joining us for the first time, we will continue to have digital services. But this is the last time we will be worshiping through a pre-recorded service. Which I am not sad about. And this is also our final service together as High Rock North Shore and High Rock Haverhill. Which I am sad about. Me too. But our collaboration isn't over we will still be friends. But after this week, we will be transitioning to in-person worship gatherings from here on out. So if you're new, you are right on time to check us out and get to know our community. You can fill out a virtual communication card by clicking on the link in the description of this video. Or if you're in person, you can point your phone at that handy QR code on the back of the pew and it will pull right up for you. We would love for you to share a little bit about who you are so that we can help you connect. And if you're part of our church family already, you can use those communication cards to share prayer requests or to let us know you want to connect with a pastor. Kids, we're especially glad that you're here with us today. Some of you are exploring our children's activity bags in the sanctuary, but if you're watching it with us from home, we'd love for you to imagine what it will be like to be back in church in person again. So find a piece of paper and something to draw with and draw a picture of a friend from church that you're excited to see again or draw a picture of the church building itself or draw a picture of me, or preferably Pastor Bryn. It doesn't have to be perfect. Church isn't perfect, but we hope you're excited to be together again with people who love and follow Jesus. Well, without further ado, please join us for our call to worship. Let's sing. Oh Lord, let my soul rise up to meet you. As the day rises up to meet the dawn, all glory to God, the Father, the Spirit, all glory to Jesus, the radiant Son, as it was in He is risen. 
by the strong Love of God forgotten But he has raised his holy arm The Prince of Peace has risen We were wounded by the strong Love of God forgotten But he has raised his holy arm The Prince of Peace has risen Death, where is your victory? Where's your sting? joy together sing a new song make a joyful noise to him let the earth sing for joy together let the sea roar let the rivers clap their hands let the hills sing for joy together sing a new song Make a joyful noise to him, let the earth sing for joy together. Let the sea roar, let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills sing for joy together. Sing a new song, make a joyful noise to him, let the earth sing for joy together.
Well, like we mentioned, this is our last virtual service. And both of our churches are going to be moving into phase two of our regathering plans. And we understand that lots of us have lots of mixed feelings about regathering. Whether that's excitement or hope or nerves or sadness or joy, as a community, we are feeling all the feels. However you're feeling about this season in our world post-pandemic and this new season in our churches, we get it. We're with you. You're not alone in how you're feeling. And many of us are feeling excited that summer is here. And after 14 months of winter, it can't come soon enough. This is the time in New England when we travel, we are outside all day, we are soaking up all the vitamin D. And this year, that is especially the case as things start to open up again. Lots of us are planning to take those vacations that we didn't get to take last summer. And having those wedding receptions we had to postpone. And visiting family again for the first time. My husband and I are too. We're going to visit family that we haven't seen since 2019. (laughs) Me too. We're traveling to visit family that we haven't seen since two Christmases ago. There are so many good and important life things that we'll be catching up on. So our plan is not to over-program church stuff. We know that everyone is going to be busy this summer. But. But. The church is also a family. And we also haven't seen each other in a long time. The gathered church was invented by God so that we could have this anchor, this picture of what Christ's body looks like in the flesh, and to be part of his mission in this world together. In a way that we just can't by ourselves. So whenever you're in town this summer, we would encourage you to join us as we regather in this family. So that by the time we kick off again in September, we've done a lot of that rebuilding catch-up work already. This summer isn't just for our staff and volunteers to practice preaching or singing again. It's for all of us to rediscover the gathered, embodied, connected church. And you are the church. So we need you here as we move forward as communities. High Rock North Shore and High Rock Haverhill are just about to start phase two, but our plans look slightly different. Both of our churches will be doing live in-person services every other week throughout June and July. The alternate weeks are about community building. They're about being with other High Rockers we've known for a while and also getting to know new High Rockers who have joined us during the pandemic. So to recap, every other week, worship services. And alternate weeks, community gatherings. Last week, we did a general overview of what June and July will look like at our churches. And this week, we want to focus on just the next step and what next weekend will be like at each of our churches. So take it away, Pastor Matt. At High Rock Haverhill, we saw a bunch of you last night at our Backbeat Bonfire, which was awesome. Our next step in regathering happens next Saturday for our church open house. Since we're in a new space, not only will it take time to get used to each other again in person, but it will also take time for us to get used to our new space. So we wanted to set aside one whole weekend to explore the new space without the pressures of also doing a Sunday service. So next Saturday, not Sunday, but next Saturday, we will have this space set up just like it will be on June 13th. We'll have Kids Rock set up, we'll have the band playing, we'll even have soul food outside. So you'll be able to find the best parking spots and scope out the best seats in the sanctuary. You'll learn where the restrooms are and you can decide how much you like the new colors we decided to paint the nursery. We'll be there to introduce you to our new teams and answer any questions you have about what High Rock Haverhill will look like this summer. So we hope to see you this Saturday, not Sunday, this Saturday, anytime between 1 and 2 p.m. That's High Rock Haverhill. Pastor Bryn, take it away. High Rock North Shore, this part's for you. Next Sunday morning, in lieu of a church service, we are hosting eat-ups all over the North Shore. We have a bunch of High Rockers already lined up who've offered to open their backyards up to small groups of about 6 to 10 people to come together for a breakfast picnic, to hang out, hear one another's stories and experiences from this last year, to reconnect with old friends, and to make new connections. All you have to do is sign up on our website or through our Church Center app by this Thursday, and we'll pair you with a host household that's close to you. Some of the eat-ups will be masked, some will be unmasked, and some will be virtual depending on risks and comfort levels. So you can let us know what works for you when you register. And of course, we'll aim to pair families with kids together so that our kids' rockers can reconnect in person too. That's our phase two plan. Before we move on, Matt, can I pray for you in Haverhill? Only if I can pray for you in Howard North Shore. Great. I'll open you close. Sounds good. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we come to you in gratitude for everything that you've been doing in both of our churches in this season. Thank you for leading us, for guiding us, for sustaining us. In times we couldn't see the course, we could trust you because you could see what we could not. We thank you for High Rock Haverhill and what a gift this community has been to High Rock North Shore. We thank you for all you've done to draw new people in and to lead High Rock Haverhill deeper and closer to you. 
We ask that in this new season of regathering, as uncertain as it is, that you would give Pastor Matt, Megan, and the rest of their leaders wisdom and unity on how to bring your people together. Give them clarity of purpose, joy in the vision, and a new energy and creativity to live out your mission and what you've called them to in Haverhill. Where they are weary, we ask that you would give them strength and perseverance. Where they are strong, we ask that you would continue to strengthen them. We pray that this church would be a blessing to our neighbors in Haverhill and the Merrimack Valley, and that people will come to know you through the words and deeds of High Rockers and Haverhill, that through this community, the people there would see your kingdom come. Jesus, I also thank you for the friendship and partnership that exists between these two churches. Today, as we mark our last joint online service together, we are deeply grateful. And I am personally grateful for the relationship that exists between these two faith communities. From everything behind the scenes, our shared sermon collaboration, our experiences with Lent and Advent, and even the process of regathering, you have been present to each of us, taking care of us, providing the support and encouragement that we needed exactly when we needed it. We have celebrated this season together, and we've also grieved together. We're part of your body, and we more clearly reflect you because of our sisters and brothers at High Rock North Shore. We ask this morning that you would embolden and empower High Rock North Shore, their pastors, their staff team, their volunteers, and their entire congregation, so that they would be a manifestation of your presence on the North Shore. Even the process of emerging from an exhausting season can be exhausting itself. So give them rest. Nourish their souls this summer. Lead them in the way that they should go. Establish for them the work of your hands and set the boundaries for them in good places. Let them drink from your living waters. By the power and grace of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, as we continue our worship this morning, if you call one of our churches home, we invite you to continue partnering with us in our mission to love and serve God and one another through the giving of God's tithes and our offerings. But if you're visiting with us this morning, we're so glad that you're here. Please let your presence be your offering. If you call High Rock home, we invite you to check out the links for each church's online giving in the YouTube description for this service. For our watch party crew at High Rock North Shore, there is an offering basket in the back of the sanctuary for you to leave any offering that you brought with you. And now, as you're able, I invite you to stand and to join us for the reading of God's word. Hi, I'm Apu, and I'm worshiping with you from High Rock North Shore. Today's reading from the Word of God comes from James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27, and chapter 2, verse 14. Please follow along in your own Bibles or listen as I read the Scriptures. Once again, that's James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27, and chapter 2, verse 14. Following the reading, I invite you to respond in worship with the singing of the doxology. Hear the word of the Lord. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Good morning, High Rock. My name is Lainey, and I'm a pastoral intern at High Rock Haverhill. And I have a challenge for you this morning. Have you ever looked at a photo and wondered, hmm, is there some Photoshopping happening here? Well, let's give it a try right now. Take a look at this one. What do you think? Genuine or Photoshopped? How about this one? Which parts are real and which do you think are fake? Now, how about this last one? You know, we live in a world where it's becoming increasingly difficult to trust if something is the authentic reality. Deciphering between deep fakes on the internet and photo apps on social media. But this difficulty between a false version of something and its authentic reality is true for more than just photos. See, this feeling of, is this the real thing, can surface in our conversations in the break room at work when we wonder if someone's actual thoughts about us match their polite smile. Sometimes it surfaces inside of us when we find ourselves misrepresenting our true emotions or vulnerabilities. Or perhaps you've had the confusing and painful experience of someone associating with Christianity, but looking very different from the Jesus we encounter in Scripture. In our passage today, we find the Jerusalem church asking a similar question of authenticity. They aren't looking at online photographs, but at people claiming to follow Jesus. See, there are people in James's community who are associating with Christ, and yet their actions, words, behaviors, and postures of their lives are in direct opposition to the values of Jesus. It's a distorted and a warped picture. And for the last seven weeks, we've studied the book of James, a book that has a lot to say about how we love God and love people as a community who follow Jesus. And today we come to the crux of James's entire message, the linchpin that holds it all together, his big preach. James says, enough with the photoshopped lives. Let me see your faith. James debunks the myth that what we believe is separate from what we do that my faith is mine and mine alone. It's like when we have life in our body, our inhaling and exhaling, move our abdomen up and down, in and out. Visible, active evidence of the life within. See, when we have the living presence of Jesus within our soul, our actions pulse with the integrity, obedience, grace, and compassion of the Lord. His authenticity is visible. Now, this discontinuity isn't hard for us to identify in other people, right? I mean, we're, we're pretty quick to see the ways other people's claims are not backed by their actions. But we find it a lot harder to identify the places of split brain within ourselves, as Pastor Bryn shared a few weeks ago. For example, we want to belong so we triangulate with our gossip and push others to the limits. We want to have enough for ourselves, so we stockpile our toilet paper just in case the places we look to for supply run out. We want to be happy, but we engage in behaviors that leave us empty, tired, and more dissatisfied than ever. Our hearts ache for the pain that we see in the eyes of a young Palestinian girl standing in the ruins of what used to be her home. But we turn all the news feeds off because we just can't handle the weight of the constant pain and the needs in our world. We want to be accepted, so we Photoshop our own souls and present a false self that we think will endear us to others, but it just isolates us further from the vulnerable being knownness that we're just desperate for. And then we come to these strong statements in James, like, faith without works is dead, or can such a faith save you? And we wonder how in the world we could ever live up to the perfect standard set before us. But if we look closer, 
the message of James is actually far less about our ability to do X, Y, and Z, and far more about what the living presence of Jesus inevitably does within our own souls. James refers to these standards, these distinctives, as the perfect law, which is the implanted word within us. I mean, think about that for a second. The implanted word within us. Think about what happens when something is planted inside of someone or something else, like an artist who adds red to the blue in their paint palette and gets a new vibrant purple, or when a fetus starts to grow inside of a womb, or even a small kernel of grain that, once inserted into the dirt, becomes long stalks of wheat. See, Scripture tells us that when we receive salvation, when we choose to follow Jesus, the presence of Christ is the living word implanted within us. See, what comes out of us inevitably points to the source of what's within us. And James, the master of analogies, emphasizes this idea of source through the imagery of a person who looks in a mirror, walks away, and immediately forgets their reflection. Now, we're used to having mirrors all around us. They're clear, they're large, they're in hallways, bathrooms, purses, wallets, but in James's context, mirrors were not quite as easy to look into as ours are today. You see, mirrors in James's time would have been made from copper or silver. Those images that they would reflect were more warped than what we see every day. They're closer to the image you get when you look into rippling water or maybe when your phone camera is smudged. It's not a perfect image. It's more like a rough resemblance. And James's point is twofold. He's pointing out that when we look to our own warped reflection, we find a distorted view of reality. Our own perspective of self, our own preferences, desires, or lack of desire, do not reveal the attitudes and manner in which we are called to live. So when we look into ourselves to find true vision, we find our own warped thought patterns and assumptions. And if we're not careful, we can assume that that's the view God sees and has designed as well. But James goes on to share that an authentic faith is birthed out of the implanted word of God, which James calls the perfect law. And the person who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, she will be blessed in what she does. Notice that James does not say that the person is perfect, but he says that the law is perfect. James tells us that this perfect law, God's word, Christ living within us, is the primary editing tool we need. It's through Christ and with Christ that we act. And James' looking into the law isn't a one-and-done affair. This is a habitual looking. This looking requires a double take. It requires a third take, a fourth take. Honestly, it requires a lifetime of double takes. And if you've ever taken still art classes or maybe watched an artist capture an image, you'll notice their painstaking focus that continuously shifts their eyes. They look at the image, then their canvas, then back to the image, and you just can't get it just right unless you keep reorienting your eyes back to the image and refresh your understanding. And the truth is that this image that we have, this Jesus, is so compelling, so satisfying, that when we authentically encounter him and give our whole selves, heart, mind, and soul to his lordship, we adopt his vision, which transforms our thinking and our doing. Sure, it's a mysterious and interesting journey that leads us into maturity. It's a life rhythm that cultivates us towards wholeness. And as a community of believers, we root our distinctive actions in the only 100% undistorted image of Jesus Christ through Scripture. Now, throughout the Old Testament, we find that the presence of God travels near his people. But then in the New Testament, something truly remarkable happens. That presence becomes incarnate in Jesus Christ. In his death, the power of life overcomes the powers of death. And in his resurrection, Jesus makes it possible for that presence of life to reside within us instead of outside of us, 
growing us and empowering us to further wholeness. But wholeness doesn't stop with you. See, authentic wholeness reaches beyond you and into the broken places of the people around you. In verse 27, James describes authentic faith as looking after the orphans and the widows in their distress. And again, in verses 14 through 17, he gives us an even more vivid picture. And if I could repaint James's story in our local terms this morning, it might go a little something like this. Suppose you get onto the tee in the middle of a New England winter, and you see someone with a thin t-shirt. It's ripped and coming apart at the seams. Their jeans are covered in holes and not the intentional kind. His hands are shoved into his pockets, but you can see him shake as the winter chill seeps through the train windows and cracks. And then next to him sits a woman, about 60 years old. You hear her sigh with a weak breath, and you find out she hasn't had a day of consistent meals in three months. So you sit with them on the tee, and when it comes to your stop, You lean over, take their hands in yours, and say, praying you get warm and fed. Then you let go, get off the tee, and go on to your next thing. In the language James originally wrote this book in, the words of be warmed and be fed are in a specific form that has the idea of someone actually doing something to themselves. It's written as if you're saying, hope you warm yourself, Or sometimes it could also be used as a sort of blessing, kind of like me saying, bless you, after you sneeze. So at best, the person is saying, I hope God warms you and I hope God feeds you. Well, the well wishes are nice words, but alone, they do nothing to change the state of the cold and hungry people on the tee. What if instead of empty statements, you ask questions? with the dignity of eye contact, or took them out for a hearty meal. Which do you think would be worth more to them? From our vantage point, it seems obvious, right? I mean, none of us like empty words or pleasantries. And yet, when we claim to be with Jesus, but our actions look nothing like his, we show our claim to be as false and empty as those pleasantries. James goes so far as to say, what good is that faith to anyone? No good to God, no good to ourselves, and no good to the other living in our midst. You see, from the very beginning of time, God's heart, as demonstrated through God's action, has always been to bring as many as will enter into relationship with himself. God's actions are purposeful with the intent of good for his people, And when we are authentically living from the same perfect law that Christ embodied, our interest is also inevitably for the good of others. See, authenticity is visible. It's purposeful. You know, growing up, my family moved a few times. Between 6th and 12th grade, I was in four different schools. I was very used to being the new kid, or that week's T, the down low, (laughs) the new mystery to be observed and inspected. I felt keenly the pressures of being immersed in shifting environments where my faith made me the anomaly. And yeah, I did a little Photoshopping, a little image editing. I'd spend the first week getting the lay of the land, watching what people wore, where they sat in the lunchroom, and what kind of things people here seemed interested in. Then I'd hit the stores for some styles that matched theirs and try out a few of the clubs or extracurriculars they seemed to enjoy. But hard as I tried, I always stood out. I was distinctive. And deep down, I think I knew that that had to be the case as a follower of Jesus. The question as a community of believers is not if we will stand out. See, Scripture is very clear that we are called to be set apart, a distinctive community. But distinctive in what ways? Yeah, I wanted deeply for my classmates and teachers and staff to see the eternal life that I got to live with every day. But how to do that was a much more complex question. 
You see, I've never been the most forward person. I'm actually much more reserved by nature. It's really difficult for me to walk up to a table at lunch and start telling someone about Jesus or even to invite them to church. And I think deep down I also felt like that was only part of the equation, that our very relational God calls me as a believer to be in relationship with those around me who don't yet know him beyond a lunchroom conversation or invitation. But for me, the line between my public and my private faith was a split-brain conversation that me, myself, and I had all the time together. But that distinction between a public and a private faith, it isn't a distinction that God sees. It's a distinction I make up in my own dissonant splitness. But God, in authentic wholeness, sees no distinction. Authentic faith is purposeful in its relational pursuit of others. And if the wholeness that Christ's spirit forms within me stays within me, instead of reaching beyond me into the broken places of the people around, then my faith is rendered no good to anyone. Just an empty, devoid of true life, pixelated and fake. See, a private faith is a pointless faith. But authenticity is visible. And the purpose of life is transformative. It's shaping, it's moving, it's inherently active. And while we may have split brains sometimes, Jesus' saving and life-giving work within us doesn't. There's not a gene that you gain when you choose to follow Jesus that's a simply believe gene. And then another gene where you simply do. No, it's precisely because of the saving and life-giving work within us that we're compelled to do and do according to the word of God, which inevitably means doing things differently than we would do if we weren't connected to the life-giving source of Christ. As followers of Jesus, we are called to be a distinctive community, not to be separate or isolated from those who have yet to meet Jesus, but to be recognizably distinct. Knowing Christ intimately and authentically means we are transformed into new creations who see differently, think differently, speak differently, and ultimately act differently. Not through a blurry mirror, but piercing through our photoshopped world to engage the way that God does. Now this probably isn't news to you. If you're watching online or in the church on Dane Street and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you've probably heard before the idea of the community of God being a distinctive community. And if you're joining us today and you're not a follower of Christ, odds are you too have seen followers of Christ who uphold what they would call distinctive values. Or maybe there's even distinctive values that you would attribute to the church as a whole. Today, I'd like us to probe what those distinctive values truly are and should be. Are our actions, the distinctive values and actions we orient our lives around, those that bring life into the spaces that we inhabit? Close your eyes for just a minute and think of three things that come to mind when I ask, what was distinct about Jesus? What was Jesus known for? What made people stop and say, oh, hey, I wonder if that's Jesus. Think of those three things. Now, keep your eyes closed and think of three more things that come to mind for how the church is distinctive. What are Christians known for? When people hear that Christians are coming, What thoughts or feelings emerge? Okay. Now consider both lists. Where did the two overlap? Did they overlap? Now, ask yourself the same questions, but this time... Try and imagine that you're not sitting in a Christian church right now listening to my sermon. Imagine you've never heard a sermon preach in your entire life. You're someone who never went to church or someone who was burned by the church. Now what does that picture look like? How does the image of the church you're seeing from this vantage point 
compared to the image of Jesus. Well, in a 2019 Barna study, 73% of 18 to 35-year-old Christians felt that the church was making a key difference in the world, especially as it relates to corruption, racism, poverty, and pollution. But within that same 18 to 35-year-old segment, When people were asked who claimed no faith, that number went from the 73% down to 32%. And a quarter of those 32% people said that this gap in perceiving actionable impact by the church would actually cause them to doubt things of a spiritual nature. Now, If the church did absolutely everything so-called right, would all people suddenly decide they love the church and desire to love God? Sadly, probably not. We can't completely control perception, but we are responsible for our actions. So are our distinctives as followers of Jesus more about what we stand against Or do we clearly and authentically live by what Jesus stands for? When our distinctiveness becomes defined by what they are and what we are not, instead of who Jesus is and so we are, we've missed it. So in a society that values airbrushing reality, how do we reflect the authentic image of Christ? Well, how about this? What if someone sees the way that you persevere amidst a really hard and painful situation in life? Or what if someone saw Jesus in you by the way you seek the Lord in a manner that trusts he'll speak and guide you? Maybe someone could know you were a follower of Jesus in the way that you give the less powerful and glamorous the front row seat instead of a corner of the floor in the standing room only section. Or perhaps it's the way that you will sacrifice your comfort or personal ambition to obey God's direction on your life. And what if, what if you use your words to spark encouragement, truth, and strength in someone instead of sowing seeds of distrust, animosity, or fear? What if these were the things visible in our lives. The distinctive values of our source in Christ that brings and breeds life in broken places of our own souls and the brokenness of our world. And this creator God, well, he was in no short supply of creativity when he fashioned you and designed me. So how we live out these distinctives is a beautiful mosaic of personalities, giftings, and passions. And James ends this passage in chapter 2 with the stories of two people whose distinctive faith visibly reflected the heart of God. See, Abraham reflected the values of the kingdom of Jesus through his deep trust and obedience in God to provide and make a good on his promises, no matter the seeming confusion and cost of God's instructions. And then you have Rahab, who opened her home to foreigners, to spies, offering them care and protection and service to God. Abraham lived out authentic, kingdom-distinctive values by going out from his home to the place God was calling him to, and Rahab lived out this distinctiveness by bringing others into her home. One honored God through sacrifice, the other through radical hospitality. The ascetic and the activist and everything in between brings wholeness to broken places through Christ. And at the core, at the very heart of the big preach in James is this idea of wholeness. A whole faith, not in part believe and in part deeds, but a people wholly committed to Christ with our whole body, tongue, heart, mind, finances, which brings wholeness to the broken places around us. Friends, one of these things is not like the other. Our Jesus, our God, is utterly and completely distinct. May our lives reflect the distinctiveness of the one we claim to follow with our whole selves so that they may know we are his disciples. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for the powerful word that you've planted within our hearts when we choose to follow you. God, we ask that today, as we reflect on your words, you will open our eyes to the things that you've called us to be distinct in, Lord. May we see you clearly in the vision of who you are and who you call us to be. And may it translate, God, with courage, power, and boldness into action in our world, that we might be a people utterly distinct who reflect the authentic image of Christ in our world. Amen. me.
Surprise! It's me, Brent, from church. I'm the pastor of operations at High Rock North Shore. One year, one month, and 12 days ago, I recorded the welcome to our first digital service in this room. Look at me. So young. So full of life. Fifty some odd digital services later, we thought it only poetic for me to do the benediction and close this chapter of our church's story. I am incredibly proud of and humbled by what our church has done and who our church has been in this chapter. And I look forward to where God is leading High Rock North Shore and High Rock Haverhill as we march boldly into the next chapter. Friends, for the final time, digitally and pre-recorded, receive the benediction. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.